Well, Thursday was uh, opening day for Major League Baseball, and I'm a Kansas City Royals fan. I made special plans to be available to watch the game Thursday afternoon, and, and uh, the Royals have so far rewarded me by losing the first two games. Not only losing the first two games, but they've yet to score a run in a ball game. And so if you're a Royals fan, you know that you can go all the way back to last season, and they didn't score the last four innings of the last game last year, which means they're currently on a 22-inning scoreless streak. So if you're a Kansas City fan, it's about time to start reminiscing about the football season. <laughs> you remember that, don't you? I mean, the Chiefs in the playoffs, that was, that was a glorious time and so exciting. And, and you maybe, though, as a Chiefs fan, as a sports fan in Kansas City, remember that that collective sigh, that collective gasp of air that was let out of the balloon when in the first playoff game, Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback, was tackled and got up limping off the field. And it wasn't that, that sort of injury, that limp that it looks like, oh, he's going to run this off for a second or two and come right back in the game. He was breaking down in pain. He was in agony. He literally threw a fit when the coaches said, you've got to go to the locker room, you've got to get this checked out, you need x-rays, we got to determine how serious this injury was. And you were so concerned about the outlook of, well, certainly his health, his injury, and the team in that game, and, and all of those things. The backup quarterback came in, led a 98-yard uh, touchdown drive, but it didn't seem to put anybody's anxiety to rest. My wife received a text message at halftime of that game from her mom, from my mother-in-law that said simply, I'm praying for Patrick Mahomes' ankle. <laughs> well, Patrick Mahomes came back in the second half, and somehow he was able to finish the game. They won the first playoff game. He continued to play in the second playoff game. They won that playoff game. He, they go to the Super Bowl. When he's tackled by the ankle again in the Super Bowl and limps off the field, most people were worried, not me. I knew Grandma Judy was praying. And he came back into the game and, and led the comeback for the, the Super Bowl championship, their second Super Bowl in four years. Oh, what a memory. And so I was, I was excited, and I was excited when I heard from Sherry that her mom had decided, I, I've got to go to the championship parade. And I thought, well, this is good for her. I'm glad I'm not there, but good for her. I have a picture here. You can see the arrow. There's Grandma Judy right there in the crowd. <laughs> And in case you don't believe me, here's a picture of Grandma Judy with her daughter-in-law and friend at the parade. And I thought, she deserves to be there. She's, she's really single-handedly responsible <laughs> for the Chiefs, her intercession for the Chiefs' Super Bowl victory. I thought she deserves to be there. And sometimes, isn't it worth it? I mean, it was worth the bus ride for her, the parking hassles, leaving way ahead of time to stand in the cold, to be part of the celebration, just to see what's happening, just to watch the heroes pass by. It was many, many, many Sundays ago when Jesus approached Jerusalem and he stopped at the Mount of Olives. And he sent two of his disciples. He said, guys, I need you to go run an errand. And he sent the disciples into town to find this young colt, a donkey. And I, I love this story. I love how Jesus works because he's essentially telling these guys, I need you to go steal this donkey for me. And, and they respond, well, well, what do we do if somebody asks what we're doing with this donkey? And Jesus said, you just tell them that the Lord needs it. And so Jesus' two friends, they go into town. And they find the donkey tied up just like Jesus said it would be tied up. And they untie it and they start leading it out of town back to Jesus at the Mount of Olives when the owner comes running out of his house. Hey, what are you doing with my donkey? And they said, the Lord has need of it. The guy turns around, goes back into his house, and the disciples lead that young colt back to Jesus. Scripture says they put some of their cloaks over that donkey. Jesus climbs on and he rides that donkey colt who had never been ridden before into Jerusalem to cheers, to songs of praise, to adoration. He rides into Jerusalem 
as king. And the crowds gathered just to, to be a part of the celebration, just to be a part of the party, just to watch as the hero rides by, lying, laying their cloaks on the ground, putting the palm branches uh, before his ride into town as king, proclaiming, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Celebrating Jesus as king. We've been traveling quite a bit, Sherry and I, to, to college baseball and softball games. It wasn't so long ago. We were at a softball game, and, and after that uh, game ended, uh, some of the athletes were going with their parents and friends or whatever to, to get lunch, and so Lacey and her friend were going to go with Sherry and I to, to lunch, and uh, Lacey told the coach, hey, I'm going with my folks, and, and uh, headed out, and her friend said, I'm going with them, and, and the coach said, well, I need you to text your mom and ask permission to go with Lacey's parents. And so she did, but then they climbed into the car, and these uh, college-age young women were indignant. And her friend said, I am a grown woman. Who does he think he is? Now, I've known her since she was five years old, so I'm still struggling with the grown woman <laughs> myself. But the facts are on her side. The facts are on her side. They're, they're adults and probably didn't need to seek permission from their parents to have lunch. But I just, I, I remember the indignation. How, who does he think he is? So much that I thought maybe she would buy lunch to prove her point. <laughs> that didn't happen. Who does he think he is? What do you do? What do you do on Monday after you ride into a town to shouts of Hosanna, to people putting their coats on the ground as you, as you ride in, as, as the crowds basically proclaim you king? What do you do on Monday? Well, if you're Jesus, you go to the temple. Uh, you don't go to the temple quietly necessarily and sit in the back row. You don't go to the temple to simply teach and preach, although he would get to that. You go to the temple to make some changes, to mix things up. You go to the temple knowing that the money lenders are charging way too much for those pigeons and doves and sheep to be sacrificed, that they are prohibiting the folks who need it the most, who have the least, from worshiping their God. And if you're Jesus... Nothing makes you more angry than someone creating a barrier to worshiping their God. And so he turns over the tables and he chases the money changers out of the temple. We read this sometimes and we think, okay, well, it's Jesus. And he's kind of speaking harshly to these people, these bankers, and sending them away. But the scene would have been much more like January 6th in our nation. You know, this is no political statement, but do you remember that day and just sort of thinking, what in the world's going on? Well, everybody around the temple and everybody was there would have been thinking, what in the world's going on? In fact, the religious leaders, the folks in charge of the temple, they were saying, who do you think you are? They asked the question a little differently. They said, by Whose authority do you teach these things? By whose authority do you do what you do, Jesus? And we might think, well, it's so obvious. It's so clear. And yet the brokenness of our world that surrounds us, the brokenness of our own lives, remind us, now every single one of us has to come to terms with that same question. Who does this guy think he is? Who do we think he is? Every single one of us must come to terms with Jesus. If you know Jesus, if you've studied the Gospels at all, you know that when one of those religious leader type of guys says something like, Jesus, who do you think you are? Whose authority 
Are you teaching these things? That Jesus will sort of refuse to answer that question and at the same time answer that question. And a lot of times he does that by sharing a parable and that's exactly what he does in Luke chapter 20 verses 9 through 18 as he's stirring the pot, mixing it up in church. People are, are up in arms, the religious leaders more than anyone else. There's this clear divide between how Jesus is relating and being accepted by the crowds of people in Luke chapter 20 and how he's being accepted and treated by the religious leaders and Jesus speaks to that. He speaks to this question that they are asking that, that they are forced to confront, that every single one of us is forced to confront. Who do we say Jesus is? How do we come to terms with Jesus? And the story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 18, I think raises two questions that will help us to come to terms with exactly who Jesus really is. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to Luke, the 20th chapter. That's just Matthew, Mark, Luke in your New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 20. I'm going to dive into the story in verse 9. We're going to read through verse 18. This is what God's Word says. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into a, another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit from the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. And when, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. All right, this interesting story that Jesus tells here. And, and two really simple questions that I think as we explore uh, it will help us to, to come to terms with exactly who Jesus is to us. Who we need to declare Jesus as. Question number one is, what do you know about the servants. Uh, we're going to take a look at the first few verses here as Jesus tells the story. And, and before we get to who the servants are and what we know about the servants, there are a few more characters we have to unpack. This, this parable is really more allegory than it is parable. And so these characters absolutely represent someone bigger than themselves in the story. And so we start with this landowner with this farmer. And the story would have made perfect sense to Jesus' audience. This sharecropping method was, was pretty common in the first century. There would be a landowner who would rent his, his land, in this case a vineyard, out to farmers. And, and the way that these farmers would pay rent on that land is that at harvest time, the landowner would come back and he would receive a portion of the crops, a portion of the harvest for the rent of the land. And, and so this made perfect sense to Jesus audience and and in our story the landowner here well that's that's God and we have a couple more characters that we have to unpack right away we have these we have these uh the the vineyard first of all uh, the vineyard itself and then the the tenants and what we know about vines and vineyards if you go back to the old testament God often described his people as a as a vineyard, as a vine. And in places like uh, uh, the 80th Psalm, uh, the 80th Psalm, verses 8 through 10, it says, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Now, here in the 80th Psalm, we see this, this vine being led out, brought out of Egypt. Who, who was brought out of Egypt? Well, it was all those. Hebrew slaves, wasn't it? Led 
freed from Pharaoh, led away from Pharaoh in Egypt by Moses, that God rescued out, and the nation of Israel was born in that moment. So this vine is led out of Egypt. And here, uh, the person taking care of the vine is, is God himself in the 80th Psalm. You go back to Jesus' story in Luke chapter 20, and, and the landowner has some tenants caring for the vine or the vineyard. These tenants, uh, remember, there's, there's this distinction. If you read the last few chapters of the Gospel of Luke, you're going to see this, this progression of how Jesus relates to the crowd and how he talks to the, the people, Luke describes them, this crowd, the, 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 the common people, and how he talks to the religious leaders. And here, the, the vineyard, they are God's people, and the tenants are those God has placed in charge of caring for the vineyard. In this case, the religious leaders who are banging on the tables overturned, saying, whose authority is it that you preach and teach and do these things, Jesus? Who do you think you are? And Jesus is preaching straight at them in this very moment. He's telling them, He's telling this story for those religious leaders benefit most of all. And so we, we've got the vineyard, that's God's people. We've got the landowner, that's God himself. We've got the tenants, those are the religious leaders caring for the vineyard. And what happens in our story is that this, this sharecropping experience comes to fruition. And, and the landowner sends some servants. The first senate, uh, servant shows up. And what happens to him? He's beat up and thrown out. The second servant shows up and is treated likewise. The third servant, Scripture says, is wounded as well and cast out. Every single one of these servants was mistreated. Their authority as a representative of the landowner was ignored. The message that they carried, not complied with, there was no obedience, there was no fruit, and the servants were destroyed, each one of them. Now, who does that remind you of? If you've studied the Old Testament, it probably reminds you of the, ser uh, of the prophets of the Old Testament, at least some of the time. You remember Elijah, Mount Carmel, there's this great scene, this battle of, of prayers and altars and, and fire and water and, 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 and God consumes the, the Elijah's altar and the, the prophets of Baal are dancing around and cutting themselves and failing and, and, and Elijah wins this victory. In fact, Elijah destroys hundreds of prophets of Baal. He wins this literal battle not just the spiritual battle, but the literal physical battle with these, these prophets of Baal. And then we find Elijah running for his life. He's scared to death. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, the, the first four verses here, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. If I don't kill you, the gods should kill me, she says. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah feels completely alone. He feels completely left out. He is scared for his life, and he's begging just for it all to end. And Elijah the prophet was for sure mistreated. Or how about the prophet Jeremiah? The prophet Jeremiah has such a cheery message for the people of God that his nickname is the weeping prophet. Right? He's mourning for the sins of God's people over and over again. He's mourning the fact that no one pays attention until somebody finally pays attention like this in Jeremiah chapter 20. Now Pashur the priest, the son of Emer, who was chief officer of the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Pashur beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks in, in, that were in the upper Benjamin gate at, of the house of the Lord. And so when fi someone finally pays attention to Jeremiah, it's the religious leaders of their day who have no stomach 
for the message of judgment that Jeremiah is bringing, and so they beat him and put him in the stocks in hopes to quiet him. The prophets faced persecution over and over and over again. Elijah's, uh, Elijah's successor, Elisha, Face persecution too. This is one of my favorite stories of persecution. It's in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23, because Elisha is persecuted by this rambunctious group of middle schoolers. Verse 23 says, He went up from there to Bethel. While he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like he's preaching right at you. Uh, we're not going to read the end of that story because it doesn't end well for the middle schoolers. <laughs> and maybe that's not the height of uh, prophets' persecution in the Old Testament. But over and over and over, God sends these messengers. The prophet's main job, you know, we think of foretelling the future. The prophet's main job is always to foretell God's word. And so they are explaining God's word to the people. They're saying, live like this. Repent from your sins. Turn back to God. Obey. Listen. Pay what's due. And over and over and over again, these representatives of the landowner, of God, are ignored and cast out until finally it's Jesus standing before them and they're asking the same question by whose authority do you teach these things who do you think you are we can see the history of God's steadfast love and patience as over and over his people ignore him turn their backs they even beat the servants that he sends on his behalf and send them away. Okay, so we know a little bit about the servants. Question number two is what do we know about the son? Because there's a turn in the story here that the audience really wouldn't have been expecting. They, they sort of hear this. Okay, the landowner sends some servants and they're mistreated. All right, and so then we get to this point in verse 13. Uh, then, then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. The, the, the twist in the story is that the landowner would have never sent his son. This was a different level. The, the servants were representatives, were ambassadors for the, the vineyard owner, for the land owner. But the son, he, he might as well have been going himself the landowner. And the son was, was the very symbol, the very presence, the same authority as the landowner himself. That's how he would have been viewed to Jesus' audience. And, and so it's no wonder that they, they are sort of letting out that gasp as the, as the landowner decides to send his own beloved son. What do we know about this son? Well, that phrase, beloved son, it ought to call back maybe to a story like Jesus' baptism. I remember Jesus goes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, you ought to be baptizing me, and they kind of have this back and forth, and finally Jesus said, no, this is what God wants, and so the Baptist baptizes Jesus and lifts him out of the water, and the heavens part, and a dove descends, and the Holy Spirit shows up, and a voice from heaven declares, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This son in the story represents Jesus. We go a little further in the story and we see that the response to the son is no different than the response to the servants. And in fact, they're, they're sort of built up with even more vengeance and rage and anger. They say, this is the heir. If we kill him, then maybe we'll inherit the vineyard ourselves. We'll have control over all of this. And so that's what happens in our story. We don't have to go too many more chapters in the Gospel of Luke to see these religious leaders carrying out that same plan with Jesus himself, this beloved son who was beaten and hung on a tree 
and executed. The son in our story, well, it's Jesus. Uh, we get to this point where the landowner has to ask, what will come, uh, what will happen to those tenants in verse 14? Uh, the landowner decides, well, I'll go and I'll destroy them. And we get this response of, surely not. The audience can't believe it. It, it reminds me of, of, of this conversation Jesus has with Peter. And you remember Jesus is describing, telling his disciples, I'm going to have to go to the cross, I'm going to die, I'm, I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I'm going to raise again, and they don't really get it, and even to the point where Peter said, I'll never let that happen. Oh, they, they can't kill you, Jesus. And what does Jesus, how does Jesus respond? Get behind me, Satan. It seems so harsh, doesn't it? I mean, Peter is, he's a good guy here, isn't he? He's saying, no, I will not let them kill you, Jesus. And yet Jesus said, when you get in the way of my father's plans, you're no better than the enemy himself. Surely not, the religious leaders cry out. But when you get in the way of God's plan, you are no better than the enemy himself. And so Jesus points back to the 118th Psalm in verse 17. He says, this is what's written. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The 118th Psalm, we read a little bit from it earlier, was, was saying, proclaimed as Jesus rode into town on Palm Sunday. It was, it was a, a, a psalm that had come to be associated with the crowning of the king. It's a psalm that over and over talks about God's faithfulness, his steadfast love that endures forever, and how he is going to rescue his people someday. And now Jesus points to this psalm, and he talks about a cornerstone. Look, I, I'm no expert in this, but I, I read a little bit about cornerstones, and, and uh, this is what one Bible scholar has to say about them. He says that the total weight of the building rested on this particular stone, which if removed would collapse the whole structure. The cornerstone was also the key to keeping the wall straight. The builders would take sidings along the edges of this part of the building. If the cornerstone was set properly, the stonemasons could be assured that all the other corners of the building would be at the appropriate angles as well. Thus the cornerstone became a symbol for that which held life together. And here's this stone, this rock that the religious leaders are rejecting. And Jesus said, that's me. And I will become the cornerstone. The most important part. The foundational piece. I, it's easy to see that that's Jesus, isn't it? When we keep our eyes on him, our foundation is firm. When we trust in him, our lines, our direction is kept straight. He sets that plumb line in our life, and we follow after him. I, I wanted more uh, uh, description of, of what this is. I needed somebody else to interpret this for me. And so I looked to one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, in Acts chapter 4. This is after Jesus' death in his resurrection. And Peter and John show up in Acts chapter 4 preaching and teaching about the resurrection in that same temple where Jesus is being questioned now in Luke chapter 20. And the same religious leaders asked Peter the same question they asked Jesus. By whose authority do you teach these things? By whose authority do you do these things? How did you, whose authority did you heal this man, this crippled man you just healed? And this is Peter's response in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. He says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone 
It was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, or Peter lays it out about Jesus as the cornerstone. He said, look, there are some builders who are rejecting this stone. Those builders are, are the rulers and the people and the elders listed in verse 8 of Acts chapter 4. And Jesus is the stone that they've rejected who has become the cornerstone. What does that mean? That everyone who trusts in Jesus, foundation can be firm. Their direction can be set straight. Their lives can be changed. And it's only, it's only in trusting Jesus that that foundation for all of eternity can be secure. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What do we know about the Son? Even though he was rejected. Even though we may reject him. He is the cornerstone. And when we trust in him, our foundation forever and ever and ever is firm. Our direction, our our destiny, our eternity is straight and secure did a little bit of research just a little bit of research on cornerstones and i found this picture there's a period of time in building and construction when these cornerstones would be carved with the the year the date that the building was put up and i just thought that is so cool i i don't know where this particular building is it has no particular significance to me or or to anyone else that i know of the date i didn't choose for any reason it just showed up big and clear in in the picture right 1942 that's when this building was put up here's the cornerstone it's still standing today and i just thought you know every single one of us we have this opportunity to say yes to jesus And when we do, that date is forever etched on our heart. And he becomes our cornerstone. My very favorite verse in all of Scripture follows this sermon that Peter preaches in Acts chapter 4. Verse 13 says that those religious leaders who are asking, who do these guys think they are? Their attitudes about Peter and John changed. And they were amazed. They were amazed, first of all, because at, at their courage. Uh, especially when they realized that they were ordinary, unschooled men. Verse 13 of chapter 4 in the book of Acts says, there's nothing special about Peter and John, but for the end of verse 13, because they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I'm sure there's lots of reasons for people to take note of you in their lives. But I relate to Peter and John, ordinary, unschooled, nothing special. But someday, someday when someone will etch a date on some other stone and put it on top of me, all I want them to say is that this man has been with Jesus. Your life for all of eternity can be built on that same cornerstone. And if you've yet, if you've yet to say yes to Jesus for the very first time, don't leave today without taking that step. I'd encourage you, just write on that welcome home card, cornerstone. And I'm going to talk to you this week, and we're going to take those steps together to building that foundation on a cornerstone that never changes, never varies, whose steadfast love lasts forever. Let's stand and worship him.